Welcome back to the Warts and All podcast. I'm Susie Edge, medical doctor and historian, and I'm just fascinated by the human body and how we've treated it in life and in death. But let's face it, mostly in death. This is episode 13, unlucky one for Edward II. But first, what's been going on here? It's been a bit of a busy week. It's been a bit wild. The YouTube channel is slowly growing. I'm going to put a short film on there about what happened to the dead at the Battle of Culloden. I visited the castle last week at the castle. I'm obsessed with castles. <laughs> I visited the Battle of Culloden site, Culloden Moor, last weekend. And um, it's the moor where the Jacobites were finished off during the last pitch battle on British soil in 1746. It was a poignant place. It's a memorial and it's a war grave. There's a visitor centre and a museum there, but for me the best part was being out on the field. There are stones that mark the lost clansmen, and there's one also that's called the Field of the English. It was very poignant, and yeah, I've made a, I've made a video for that for YouTube, so look out for that. What else? Well, I've been writing. A lot of writing. <laughs> We revealed the new cover for Mortal Monarchs, the book, on Tuesday. Uh, we had so many people interested that it already gained a number one bestseller flag on Amazon, which is mind-blowing as it's not yet been published. Thank you to those of you who's pre who have pre-ordered. Uh, it's brilliant. For those not in the UK, or indeed if you are in the UK and would like a signed first edition, you can order one of those at Goldsborough Books. I will get myself down to London and sign those before they're shipped off to you. If you do order from Goldsborough Books, you can put a little note on if you'd like a personalised signed copy, and uh, I'll get that done for you as well. Just show that I really appreciate uh, you guys out there. Speaking of which, thank you and welcome to our new patron, uh, I guess I keep saying patron, 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 patron at Patreon, Sharissa uh, or Charlie. Thank you so much for your lovely comments as well and uh, <laughs> your supportive messages. It means so much. I know I keep saying that it means so much, but it really does because it's it's been a tough ride to get myself going and to have that support for my own creative endeavours is just, again, it's mind blowing. If you would like to support the book or the podcast or YouTube and my creative adventures on Patreon, you can do so at Patreon slash Susie Edge. And I really love and appreciate all that support. I was very excited to show the guys on Patreon my cover release first before it went out mainstream and I had some really lovely comments. Thank you. Shall we move on to the podcast then? This is the death of Edward II. Now, Edward II was the son of the mighty Edward I, Edward Longshanks. Edward was king from 1307, when his father died of dysentery on his way to fight Robert the Bruce in Scotland. He was deposed in 1327, and not long later, he was gone. He was known as Edward of Carnarvon. I know you've been waiting to hear about the death of Edward II, haven't you? Maybe you didn't wait, maybe you just came straight to this one, I see you. The story of the death of Edward II is stuff of legend, and... It's as well known as Charles I, as a popular story of grim regicide. Edward II was unconventional and was not really suited to a role as king or politician, but he was next in line to the throne, so that's how it happened. To some, this disappointing son of the mighty warrior king Edward I got exactly what he deserved. In anyone's time, that seems a harsh stance to take. Edward was born in Wales at Carnarvon Castle, and he was given the title of Prince of Wales at 16. There was so much hope for the future. Edward was considered a handsome young man, which was clearly very important. But he was a disappointment to many around him, including his father. Young Edward was not interested in the noble art of knighthood and the pastimes that defined kingliness and fighting men. Instead, he was more interested in the arts, in music, in plays, and importantly, in other young men. Edward's favoured friend, or favourite as we euphemistically call him, was Pierce Gaveston. And he had been brought into the prince's household by the king in an attempt to influence the prince to great things. It was a decision Edward I would probably regret as it led to such difficulties. By difficulties, I mean that the relationship between the Prince of Wales and the supposedly proud and playful but arrogant Gaveston led to fisticuffs between father and son, and between prince and nobles. 
In one episode, old Edward, in a display of outrageous angry behaviour, held Prince Edward down and pulled out clumps of his hair. He then banished Gaviston from the kingdom. Now this whole sorry spectacle was not that long before the death of Edward I, and so the new king, Edward II, with new freedoms, brought his friend back. He brought him back from exile as soon as he was able. Gaviscon was back and continued to be good-looking and clever and egotistical and massively annoying. He was especially annoying to other nobles. He liked to make up funny nicknames for them and, unsurprisingly, they did not like that much. Gaviston was showered with gifts and lands and titles which prodded the nobles to further annoyance. A group of them eventually decided that something had to be done. In June 1312, Gaviston was kidnapped by the Earl of Warwick, Guy Beecham, and was dragged off to the infamous dungeon at Warwick Castle. There, a death sentence was pronounced, and he was moved to Blacklow Hill on Lancaster land to be murdered. The job was given to two Welshmen to finish him off. One stabbed him with a sword, and the other hacked off his head. They left his lifeless body to rot where they had decapitated him. It was left to some monks to retrieve Gaviston's remains, do the good deed and bury the king's friend. And today a monument stands on the site where Gaviston was murdered. And Gaviston might have been dealt with, but when it comes to Edward having relationships that others did not care for, Gaviston wasn't the only one. And next came Hugh Dispenser. The Dispenser family had backed Edward, and so the nobles went after them too. Despite his interest in other young men, Edward married Isabella, the sister of Philip IV, King of France, and together they had four children. Now, if Edward made any smart moves, falling out with his queen was not one of them. Nor perhaps was telling people that he carried a knife in case he might see her, or if he had no weapon that he might crush her between his teeth. There was definitely no love lost between this royal couple. Now, Isabella was over in France, away from Edward, when she met up with other English nobles, the ones who had been banished, including Roger Mortimer. Now, it was a pivotal moment when their eyes met across a crowded courtyard, I don't know. Mortimer was in Paris, having escaped from the tower, where he had been imprisoned by the king, Isabella's husband. The two of them got together and hatched a plan to overthrow the king. There was trouble ahead. And there was also trouble from lots of other directions as well. Up in Scotland, Robert the Bruce was taking back castles that had been held by Edward's father, and so in 1314, Edward led an army north to face Bruce. He was defeated and humiliated by the Scots at the Battle of Bannockburn. In sight of Stirling Castle that his father had besieged, he was chased away. Now, maybe if Edward had taken his father's bones as relics to the fight, as his father had requested, there might have been some military prowess on display. But if there was, it didn't come from Edward II. Having lost in Scotland and in Ireland, having hacked off many with his relationships, as much as his incompetence, Edward II was deposed by Parliament in 1327. Edward's eldest son became Edward III. But he, I mean, he wasn't in any control. He was only a teenager. He was still getting up late and gaming all day, probably. The country was ruled by Roger Mortimer and Queen Isabella. Now, Edward II was held under guard and was moved from castle to castle whilst Edward III ruled. Sorry, whilst Queen Isabella and her boyfriend ruled. Edward was moved to Berkeley Castle in Gloucestershire. We do have an account from Geoffrey Le Baker, who wrote of the event some time later, that Edward was deliberately kept in terrible and humiliating conditions, that he was surrounded by the rotting corpses of animals in the hope that he would catch something and die naturally, so there would be no need for someone's hand in it. Edward, though, did not have a habit of doing what people wanted and did not die on request. He was pretty fit and he was only 43 years old. Deposed kings, though, they're a threat, even under lock and key, and Edward's days were numbered. When Edward did die, of course there were rumours. and Nobody knows for certain the details of Edward's death, but the story much loved of generations of schoolchildren is horrific. 
Now, one sure way of murdering the king and getting away with it without leaving behind obvious marks would be to hold him down onto something heavy and insert a red-hot poker up his insides via his rectum. It would leave no outward signs of harm. I mean, smothering wouldn't either, but, you know. Let us indulge this idea for a moment that the deposed king was dispatched in this, in this manner. It was written that Edward, who was a fit young man, did not have any protracted illness, that he died instantly of something aggressive, maybe a hot iron poker. So we can say that this poker did not just perforate the rectum and the bowel, leaving him to die a protracted state of peritonitis like William the Conqueror. For Edward, the thrust of the poker meant that he was killed in one sitting. It was deep enough and aggressive enough to cause injury to major blood vessels and cause significant disruption. Now, this instant and brutal churning of the guts would have been a bloody affair. It was said that the screams could be heard from beyond the castle walls. I mean, that, that doesn't really make sense, to be honest, because if you're going to come up with a heinous way of killing the king by red-hot poker up the bum to prevent anybody knowing what happened, then... Surely you'd stop the screams being heard outside the castle walls. Hey-ho. The idea of the Red Hot Poker was embellished and retold time and time again throughout the years. Going around at the time of some of these writings was the story of, of Edmund Ironside's death. He'd been sitting on a toilet when his assassin struck from underneath, killing him by stabbing him up the rear end. It was also a rather crude commentary made by the monks who were well, commenting on the consequences of Edmund's homosexuality, not just of the sin itself, but with it the disruption that his relationships brought to the kingdom. No one who ever wrote about the death of Edward II or made a podcast about it saw any first-hand account of the event. We all just build on rumour upon rumour, and frankly, we choose the juiciest bits. Now, the real cause of Edward's death will never be known for sure, but of course... There were stories of escape, of switching of bodies, of a life lived in exile. In the 1780s, a letter was found in Italy. It was a detailed account of Edward having escaped to live in Italy. Nobody had explained why such a letter might be written if Edward was killed at Berkeley Castle, and nobody has explained why such an elaborate death story was created if he did escape. An Italian bishop wrote to Edward III, informing him that his father had escaped to the continent, gone to visit the Pope for a bit, and then lived as a hermit in Sicily. As witness protection programmes go, I can think of worse places to be sent. At least it wasn't sterling. He would not have been welcome there. Most accounts will say that Edward died at Berkeley Castle. Then they'll say that the Red Hot Poker story is not a likely one. But there are quite a few people who like the story of him escaping. Ian Mortimer tells us that the 14th century embalming practices covered the facial features, and so that's why things were brought into question. See, nobody actually saw the body, apart from those who did the embalming. It was two days before Edward III, who was in Lincoln, received a letter informing him of Edward II's death. Now, to be fair, it was quite a trip from Gloucester to Lincoln, it is now. The face and body were covered in seer cloth, which, to be fair, was a normal thing to do in 1327. This would have been done before the arrival of anyone of importance to see the body for themselves and confirm identity. And though it was written that many were brought to see the body, it's very vague how much is many and how close did they get. Interestingly, after Edward's funeral, royal burials were then carried out with the face exposed. Ian Mortimer wrote an account of the dates and timings, concluding that Edward III or any other person of note did not get to see Edward II's body up close and identify it. No wonder there are stories of his escape. Whilst Roger Mortimer was still around, though, anyone publicly suggesting that the king was alive, well, they ended up in prison. However Edward was killed, this story, just like King Harold's at Hastings, has become the mainstay of history classes for every British school child to learn. That is, until someone on the internet then puts them right with a comment that starts, Well, actually... Thanks for listening to the Warts and All podcast. That was episode 13, The Gory Death of Edward II. If you'd like to catch up with me online, you can do so on TikTok at Susie Edge, 
on Twitter at Susie Edge and on Instagram at edge.sus. You can also find me and my supporters on Patreon at Patreon slash Susie Edge. There are details of how you can order Mortal Monarch's book on my website and in the bio, the links in the bios of all the other social media spots as well. What have we been doing on TikTok this week? Should we, should we do a roundup? This week on TikTok, we've talked about the death of Rasputin. Lots of asked about that one. Uh, I made a wee video when I went up to Culloden. We talked about robbing graves and body snatchers. We've talked about Toulouse-Lautrec syndrome, which was the affliction of Colin McKenzie, a character in Outlander. We've talked about the dead brothers of Mary, Queen of Scots, and we talked about the death of King John. So there's lots going on over there. Lots more to come this week. It would be great to see you there. The Warts and All podcast was written and produced by me, Susie Edge, with artwork by Catherine Edge. And we'll see you soon.